We might remember that last week uh, we ended on a great high note. Uh, Jesus was being baptised, you might remember, rising up out of the waters, heaven opened, uh, God's spirit was descending like a dove and alighting on Jesus. And the Father himself was speaking, revealing Jesus as the long-awaited Son of God. But also the tender words of a father, both naming and equipping Jesus, telling him what every son most needs to hear. Remember, we're all sons in Christ. The father tells him what every son needs to hear and prepares him to get him through the dark times that lie ahead. That's what good fathers do, isn't it? This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. I love you. I'm delighted with you. This is who you are to me. Here in the arms of our relationship, he's saying, is your identity. This is who you are. These are beautiful words of assurance and confidence and purpose. They're immediately put to the test. Well, welcome to week seven in our series uh, in Matthew's Dangerous Gospel. Jesus is now taken to dangerous places, which is something that we all experience in our life following Jesus. You ever notice that? We go to a fantastic uh, Christian conference or camp, you know, like men's convention in Rocky or CQ Alive camp, uh, you know, maybe even church family camp. We have some incredible experience with God and straight afterwards, the spoiler comes. He pays a visit. Have you noticed? We get hit with some sickly sweet temptation or stubborn obstacle in life, some relational difficulty in our walk with the Lord. It's why our spiritual highs are often followed by spiritual lows. It's a pattern that I've experienced over the years, and I'm not alone in this. We see highs and lows in people's walk with the Lord throughout Scripture, in fact. I mean... Look at Job. Satan just can't stand us learning to be loved by God, our Father, and our subsequent learning to love others like he loves us. So in hearing today's Bible reading, this is a pattern here that we're seeing that shouldn't be surprising to us. It's a pattern to be expected, if you like, and prepared for. We're not to be anxious about evil, but rather prepared. So straight after his baptism, Jesus finds himself out in the wilderness, in the desert places. You know, no food, it's stony, it's dry, it's barren, it's a dangerous place. Jesus is faced with a series of choices. After the Lord delivered Israel from Egypt, you know, you might remember, they came out through the Red Sea. Moses parted the Red Sea with a staff. Uh, The wilderness became their place of testing, you might remember. Out of slavery in Egypt, you know, they're delivered. It's a great thing. It's a great victory over you know, Pharaoh and all his minions. But the wilderness is also where Israel failed their test. They grumbled against God and they doubted him. They complained about everything. They disobeyed God's instructions about food. They put God to the test. Thanklessness for Israel was, a, in a sense, a rerun of Adam and Eve in the garden. Israel blamed Moses for their mistakes, like Adam blamed the woman, Eve. Israel complained about their location, 
like Adam complained about her being put there with him. And now for 40 years, Israel have wandered in the wilderness, 40 years, a journey that should have taken 11 days. And during their 40-year journey from Egypt to the edge of the Promised Land, the Jordan River, an entire generation of Israelites perished while they were heading towards the promises of God. Israel kept wandering away from the Lord who rescued them. See, the wilderness is a wild and dangerous place. And now Jesus is led into the wilderness. Verse 1, we read again, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Notice here, it's the Spirit who leads Jesus. For like Israel was, now Jesus is led by the presence of God through the wilderness. And this is the same Spirit of God who just alighted on Jesus at his baptism, where Jesus was declared to be God's ultimate son, the new and better Israel. But now as God's delightful son, his very identity is being tested in the wilderness by the tempter, just like it was with Israel so many years ago, just like it is for us now as we follow Jesus. Our identity in Christ is tested all the time. See, whenever we deepen our identity in Christ, as the delighted children of God, whenever we grow, in that precise moment, the evil one comes, sowing seeds of doubt about our identity, the tempter comes. The first here is his temptation to doubt. Jesus has been fasting. Well, he hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. He's been without food. I imagine I'd be pretty hungry too. <laughs> Suddenly, out of nowhere, this new character slides into view, doesn't he? an unmentionable character, unmentioned directly to this point, the devil, Satan himself. But as we'll see, he always has the same role to play. Whenever God creates delight, he comes and tries to spoil it. Just like he did in the garden with Adam, just like he does here after Jesus' baptism. You see, this is a direct attack on Jesus' identity. It's a temptation to doubt who he is. He says to Jesus, if, you notice that? If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But you see, God has just declared Jesus is his son. But now that relationship is being brought into question. If Jesus engages with the evil one's question, he validates the doubt that's being sown. Sowing the seed of doubt is what the evil one will do in any relationship. It's what the evil one did in Eden. He asks and he questions the relationship. It's always the same old story. Once again, you'll notice, food is involved. For Adam, it was the fruit of the tree. For Israel, it was the manna from heaven. And for Jesus, now it's bread again. But unlike the failed sons of God that came before him, Jesus chooses to remember his relationship with his father. Instead of doubting, like the evil one suggests, Jesus sees that he's being tested. It is written. 
Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus knows who he is because he knows who his father is. Jesus is secure in his identity by remembering God's pleasure and love, his own delight with his son. And as we saw last week, God's delight in his relationships is a foundation for us. It's a foundation for our faith. Jesus quotes God's word in Deuteronomy, where Moses commanded Israel to remember. Remember how you were tested. Remember how humbled you were in hunger. Remember how God fed you. Why? Well, it's so that they would learn that man does not live by bread alone. That for every human soul, the whole material world is not enough. That what you need for your life is every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. His guidance, his instruction. Have you learnt this yet? This is what we need in our life. When God tested Israel in the wilderness, uh, Deuteronomy 8 says he did this to reveal their hearts. So when tested with hunger, the sons of God always reveal what's in their hearts, in our hearts too. When tested, Adam indulged his own desires. Israel complained about the manna. They chose to forget God's word, but now Jesus, the Son of God, reveals what's in his heart by actually remembering. When tempted to doubt, Jesus remembers. Secondly there, he's tempted to test God rather than rest securely in him. As the devil changes his temptation, he also changes location, you might notice, from the parched wilderness to the place of plenty, uh, the big city, Jerusalem itself, to the highest point of the temple. Once again, the tempter strikes at Jesus' identity. Verse 5, the devil took him to the holy city, set him on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he says again, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, this time, you'll notice the evil one quotes a couple of Bible verses himself, doesn't he? He starts to, you know, I can play this game. He's quoting Psalm 91 about God protecting his people. In Psalm 91, it says, Since God is my God, my fortress, my refuge, I can trust him to shelter me from my troubles. He'll deliver me from danger. He'll send his angels to protect me so I won't strike my foot against a stone. Now, it's not that the evil one is twisting God's word here like he did in the Garden of Eden. Instead, he's taking it completely out of context. A text without a context is just a con, some people will tell you. Psalm 91 is about resting in God and trusting him in all things. It's not about jumping off the top of the temple, seeing if his angels will catch you. It's a terrible application of a delightful song, Psalm 91. So the devil basically saying here, Jesus, if God provides Psalm 91 levels of protection for you, and if you really are the son of God, let's just see how well that goes. Go on, jump. Test God. How much does he really love you? How often does that question come into your own mind? How much does God really love me? 
Have you ever asked that yourself? Am I truly loved? Here is the devil's test, isn't it? He's not only testing Jesus' confidence in his own identity, he's testing the strength of the relationship at this point. But this is a strong relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Jesus doesn't react out of fear at this point. He doesn't react out of insecurity. He doesn't play the evil one's game at all. He responds rather than reacts. He rests in God. He trusts in God rather than testing him. Jesus simply responds with more scripture, with God's word again, because the best defense against the dark arts of this world isn't a, you know, a magic spell or anything. It's simply responding with God's word. Again, Jesus remembers Deuteronomy. We're in the wilderness at a place called Massah where Elizabeth read for us this morning. The people of Israel demanded water. They even asked, is God with us or not? And there the people put God to the test. Israel failed their test at Massah. Their unfaithfulness to God was clear, just as Jesus' faithfulness to God is clear now. Jesus rests in God's protection instead of testing it. Satan fails when Jesus answers him, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And now our location changes a third time. This is like the third scene of the temptation, the testing. Now we go to the mountains. Matthew calls it a high mountain. It's hard to know which mountain exactly that he means, uh, but uh, it's, it's up high. Satan offers Jesus a whole lot more than what Moses missed out on on the edge of the promised land. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I'll give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, one of the obvious questions you might wonder at this point is, are all the kingdoms of the world even Satan's to give away? And, of course, you might be right if you said the answer is no. Only God has authority over all things. Now, Satan clearly has some major influence in this world, uh, but it's only momentary. It's only earthbound, if you like. Uh, but it's also hellbound. There's a future destination like all the kingdoms of this world, actually, momentary. They won't last. Their glory won't last. They cannot and will not last forever. But there's another obvious question you might ask. Isn't this what will come to Jesus anyway? All the kingdoms and their glory do become his. We read that at the end of Matthew's gospel, don't we? Matthew 28, 16 says the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what Satan is offering Jesus here is a shortcut. A race to the top, if you like, without having to start from the very bottom, the depths, if you like. It's like a sidestep, a cheat sheet, um, 
a counterfeit victory or a fast track to success, even though he has no authority to grant it. See all this, Jesus? It's all yours if you will just bow down and worship me. Now, this is important for us in our time. There are some so-called churches, some so-called forms of Christianity that offer the keys to success and prosperity without the hardship. But in following Jesus, there are no shortcuts. There's no express lane, if you like, when it comes to living the life of obedience, following Jesus is not the fast ticket to the easy life. It's a tempting offer, though, isn't it? To race past suffering and trouble instead of facing it or having to face it, and to shortcut the relationship with God and just skip to the benefits. It's so tempting, isn't it? Honour without humility, authority without suffering, glory without perseverance, knowledge without learning somehow, resurrection without death. The evil one is tempting Jesus to race to the end and not face what's ahead of him. But Jesus wants to love each and every one of us. There's a death he needs to die before he can be raised to life. There's a suffering in the night to appreciate that joy which comes in the morning. Jesus wants to face his destiny without any shortcuts because Jesus insists on meeting us where we really are and to come near to us as he really is. Once again, this is a test, a temptation. How committed is Jesus to being that suffering servant, son of God? For a third time, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. Away from me, Satan, for it's written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Which is Jesus' total rejection of the devil's temptation to bow down and worship. By quoting Deuteronomy, Jesus again takes us back to that wilderness of Israel where they'd failed to obey the Lord. Remember, they made a golden calf and bowed down to it and worshipped it as their God. But where the sons of Israel failed to obey God, Jesus, the true son, is triumphant in his obedience. He insists on facing his destiny, not running away from trouble. And at this point, the devil now leaves Jesus. Angels come and minister to him, to feed him, to attend to him. Hungry and alone, Jesus was told to turn stones into bread, to throw himself off the temple, to worship another in the place of his father. So when you're hungry and alone, by which I mean feeling desperate perhaps or disoriented, lonely, when you're looking for a way out or relief from some kind of situation, what are the temptations that come to you? What questions do you begin to hear yourself ask? Maybe it's, does God really love me? Will he really protect me? Does he have my best interests at heart? Will God ever keep his promises to me? Sometimes I hear myself asking these questions. As Christian believers, as followers of Jesus, we have an enemy. The evil one, the devil, is real. We need not be anxious, but prepared. 
He comes sowing his seeds of doubt and distrust. It's the same old character playing the same old role. Temptation will strike at the heart of our identity. Testing will always reveal where we're at in our hearts. And so it's vitally important we know who God really is and who we are in Jesus. And what God says about Jesus is what God also says about us. Listen again to what God says about his son. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. That's what God now says about you when you're found in Christ. Don't let the evil one make you doubt this truth. He loves and delights in his children. It's declared all over the pages of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, Matthew chapter 1 through to Matthew 28. The only way we can feed our identity in Christ that it might grow and strengthen is to feed on God's word. If you've gone longer than 40 days and 40 nights without feeding on what God says about you, you might be asking for trouble. But when we are in trouble, when we find ourselves desperate and lonely, when we blame, grumble or complain, God calls us back to him. When he looks at us, he sees his son, our Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus lived a life here of choices, obedient choices, living with a deep sense of mission and purpose. Because he's faithful as the son of God, he's able to help us when we're tempted. Perhaps you need Jesus to help you right now. Just ask him. So your life of following Jesus is not just a statement to be believed or an event to attend. It's a life to be lived. A life of dying and rising again and following our master. It's a life of intentional choices, dangerous choices, based on God's promises, lived out in our lives in dangerous places. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that Jesus resisted the temptation of the evil one where none of us could have. But now he provides a way for us to stand. Lord, we thank you that Jesus did eventually go to that cross and die in our place, that we might be forgiven that we might have that right to call you our Father. Lord, we pray that we would not forget this. We ask now that you would strengthen us in our identity as your people. And we pray that as your children, we might share the good news of Jesus with those around us. Lord, help us to survive in dangerous places. Help us not to give in to those temptations in the dark of night when we question. Help us to remember your word to us. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.